Hello and welcome to our Out of Eden Learn Hangout Q special Q&A session with Paul Salapak. We're here in Central Asia in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, and we're super excited to be here today. Um, so what we're going to do first is have every educator who's joined us on screen say a brief hello, give your name and where you're located. And if your students are with you, and we know some classes are there, um, we want to hear the voices of students saying hello. So we're going to start first with Steve. Remember to unmute your microphone when you introduce yourself. Steve, we can't hear you. <coughs> okay, maybe we'll, we'll try to see if you can work out the audio problem. Um, but let's have Rob introdu introduce himself and his students in the... Oh, Steve, you're on. <laughs> okay, we're not able to hear you again. We were, we were hearing you before. <laughs> um, so, Rob, can you introduce your class and maybe we can loop back to Steve in a moment? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Rob. Yes. Uh, hi, Paul, uh, from Chennai, India, and my students, say hi. <laughs> hey, guys. <laughs> nice. Nice. Really loud and clear. That's Wonderful. Good. You, got a, you got a cheerleading squad there, Rob. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Mark. Can you unmute your microphone? We're excited to hear from you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, my name's uh, Mark. I'm coming to you from uh, a rainy California in Oxnard. I think it only rains about 10 days a year and it's raining today, but it's mm -hmm. nine o'clock at night, so my students are all at home. Mm -hmm. And it's my first time uh, taking part in this uh, process, so thank you. Mm. Hey, Mark, welcome. Okay, great. Kristen. or something for different people. I'm Kristen, I'm from Kamwela, Hawaii in the USA. And my students are not only not here because it's seven o'clock at night, but they're also on winter break. Otherwise they probably would have been here. So thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, nice to meet you, Kristen. Kelly. Hi everybody, hi Paul. Uh, this is Kelly from Chinese International School in Hong Kong, and I'm joined by my year three and year six students and teachers. Everyone say hi. <laughs> wow. We have a few students here. Thank you. <laughs> Just a few. Nice to meet you. John. Yeah, hello everybody. Um, my name's John from, um, I'm working in Dar es Salaam. I'm International School of Tanganyika, and I'm here with a grade four class. Let's say hello. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Great. Nice to meet you. And Brenda. Hi, I'm Brenda from Vancouver, Canada. I, it's nine o'clock at night, so I'm solo. Um, <laughs> I've been involved with Out of Eden Learn since the pilot session I think so I've been going through a few go around so I'm excited to be here and speaking with you kind of semi in person for the first time yeah great to meet you finally Brenda thanks Brenda okay I want to loop back to Steve Steve can we give it a try again I hope I hope we can hear you we can't hear you, but we know that Steve is saying hello, hey, and we are excited, and we know that Steve <laughs> has a group of students with him. He's in Tangerang, yeah. Indonesia. Oh, cool. Very nice. So very warm nice welcome. Nice to meet you, Steve. Okay. So a couple of more introductions. My name is Carrie James. I'm a co-director of the Out of Eden Learn uh, project, and I want to turn the camera to some other members of the team who want to say a quick hello who are here in Bishkek. <laughs> so we have Julia Payne from Out of Eden Walk. Nice to see everybody. Hello. Emmy Kane from the Abundance Hi, Foundation everyone. who supports our work. Everyone knows Shea from Out of Eden <laughs> Learn. Shari Tishman, a co-director. Liz Doster Ising, a co-director. Terrific. And so now I want to invite Paul to say a quick hello. And Paul, just a few words. You know, when did you arrive in Bishkek? Mm. What were the most recent steps you took okay. to get here? Well, I just. Uh, you know, when, you, when you're walking around the world, you're, 
some of your biggest obstacles are natural obstacles like seasons. So it's now winter time and I'm in Central Asia where there are very big mountains covered with snow. So I'm stopping for the winter in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan until the springtime, until the, the snows on very high mountains, some of them are as high as 7,000 meters, that's about you know more than 20,000 feet, um, goes down and melts and allows me to walk over into China. So I got here about three weeks ago and I walked in from Uzbekistan. So I'm kind of in my winter winter den, as it were. Terrific. Thank you, Paul. So we want to go to um, a round of questions from the participate uh, from from you folks on screen, but I'm going to weave in some additional questions um, from students who've sent um, sent their questions by questions in by email, um, but their teachers were not able to participate today. But I want to first start with someone who's on screen. Um, so how about Brenda? Um, do you have a question from your students or from yourself for Paul? I do. I actually have a number of questions, but I'll start with one. Or I'll, I'll start with two and let you pick. One of the students was wondering how do you feel about the mix between this kind of ancient system of migration and movement and coupling it with modern technology while you do this walk around the world. So that's one of the questions. And then the second question was, um, how do you find people are responding differently to your story, your project, or your being there? So your choice on which question you want to answer. Okay. Um, well, that, you know, the, the first one is, is kind of a new one. So I think I'll, I'll take option A. And it's, it's an interesting one. Uh, it's it's actually kind of lovely to be able to dip into the deep past doing my homework, studying about ancient migrations that go back to the Stone Age, and then to understand that I'm following the campfires of our ancestors as they've moved across the world, now moving across Asia towards the Pacific, and then to be able to use modern technology to communicate that. I think it's actually very nice, and it makes me feel very lucky to be alive today in the world, to have this technology, to share it, right? Because a hundred years ago, I would be writing dispatches on a piece of paper and then only being able to share it maybe by telegraph at best, or if not, then on a ship. And it would r arrive to you guys, you know, weeks or months later. So it's a very cool time to be alive, um, to think about old things, but share them in a very new way. Thank you, Paul. Thanks. That that actually connects with a question a question that was raised by um, a couple of students who had emailed in. Uh, Paul, you just mentioned that you can use these technologies to communicate, but um, there's still sort of the technology of language. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. a couple of students uh, had questions about what language you uh, speak when you mm -hmm. talk to people you mm -hmm. meet and how many languages you yourself uh, speak and feel fluent in or maybe right. rusty in but working right. on. Yeah, working on is always, all the time. Um, yeah, of course, being uh, born where I was born in, in the United States, my, my native language is English. But I had the great good fortune to be raised in, in another country as well. So I was raised in Mexico. So I speak very fluent Spanish. Um, from the, and I've got an accent from the mountains of Western Mexico. My Spanish is good, but kind of regional. And then I've picked up, working in Africa for more than 10 years, I've picked up kind of a working knowledge of French which my Spanish has helped with. Um, and then so many years in the Middle East, I have a, a kind of a, a rudimentary vocabulary in Arabic. And over the last year, I've been learning Russian as I walk through kind of the, the former Russian uh, empire's kind of margins here. And so the next challenge is Chinese. And so what, what's interesting to me is that stuff kind of gets pushed back into the language compartment in my brain. And by the end of the trip, um, it'll be interesting to see what this mishmash is, uh, what's it, what, what it sounds like. So those are the languages. But when I write, when I interview, I, I use uh, English because it's just, it's easiest for me. And fortunately, as Paul was telling me this morning, uh, National Geographic is doing a lot of work around translation. So that yes. the things he writes um, are, are more broadly available. Yeah, we're, you know, if you go to the website, the National Geographic website, there, there are categories. You hit explore and it says category and it says languages. And you'll see, I think we have 18 maybe by now, uh, different languages. And probably it's, they're the major languages of the world that might be yours. 
Yeah, and on the Out of Eden Learn team, as some of you know, we're innovating with languages. Rob's, uh, some of Rob's students, uh, Rob in Chennai, India, some of his students are participating in our Spanish program. Um, so we're excited that we've got that up and running recently, and we hope to explore other languages down the road. Okay, so how about a question from John? Remember to unmute yeah, your microphone. I've, I've got a student to ask a question. Is that okay? That's terrific. Perfect. Do you want to come and ask the question? Do you want to come and just stand? Yeah, the students came up with some uh, a few questions. We had a bit of a session yesterday where we were thinking of some things we could ask you. Great. Okay, here we go. What has been your favorite favorite thing about Uzbekistan? My favorite thing about Uzbekistan. Um, well, I've got to say, as always, my, my first answer that comes to mind is people. There were some amazing people that I met. And Uzbekistan is a really, really old uh, part of the world that's been inhabited a long time. It's been farmed for thousands of years because it has these big rivers that go through the, go through the middle of it. And they've been uh, tilling the soil there probably since uh, the beginning of, of agriculture. So they're farmers, the people I met mostly were farmers along rivers and of course there were some amazing and hospitable people who took us in at night uh, you know gave us a cup of chai and uh, and even gave us a, a roof to sleep under so um, I think it was the people of Uz Uzbekistan that was one thing and the second thing very quickly was the amazing Islamic architecture mm -hmm. of the Silk Road cities it's just the uh, Karahanid states that that flourished about mm, three to five hundred years ago produced beautiful buildings and that was a real treat. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. that question. Good question. Um, I want to make a quick correction uh, to what I said before about, about Rob having some Spanish uh, students. It's actually uh, Rob's wife, Floor, who has students um, from Chennai, India doing the Spanish program. Shea just nudged me on that. Um, so a quick question. Uh, this is a question from Julia's fifth grade class in Maine. Um, someone, uh, one of her students asked, when was one of the times when you met someone that changed your life? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, that, that happens um, more, f more often. That's a great question. Um, and I think that happens more often than we, than we know, right? Because there are two ways to answer that. There are people we meet who are so remarkable that we know they're going to nudge us in a different direction. And then there are people we meet who we don't realize changed our life until we maybe have walked on. Um, there are teachers all along our road of life. Want p teachers that we realize are called teachers and others who, who aren't. And I think um, on this journey, my best teachers, I have to say, are the people that I'm walking with, my walking guides. They have changed my life because they've literally, and this is no joke, they have literally changed the direction that my life is going in, right? Um, it's not just right or left, it's what kind of experiences are going to fill my days and every, every decision that they help me make and influence changes my life. I've made terrific friends with my walking partners. I stay in touch with them. Um, I'm in contact with their families. Some are eager to come back and join me. And I can give you many examples from Mohammed Benuna in Saudi Arabia, from Murat Yazar in Turkey, from Aziz Khalmuradov in Uzbekistan. Our, our lives become intertwined with this journey and it's just this growing and more colorful braid so uh, that's kind of a long answer, but it's, it's, if, you, if you go back through the stories and look for the people I'm walking with, those names are the people who've changed my life in the last four years. That's great. Thank you, Paul. And we have been fortunate on the Out of Eden Learn team to come to know some of your guides and to have them participate in Google Hangouts and uh, share their words through and some we'll of our more. blog posts. Mm -hmm. And we plan to continue to do that as Paul's journey goes on. Um, so Kelly, we'd love to hear a question from you or from one of your students. We have one of our year three students that are prepared to ask a question. Ask a question in the microphone. Hi, I'm from 3A Chinese International School in Hong Kong, and I want to ask you what is the most amazing discovery you have made in your journey? So, what is the most amazing discovery you have made on your journey? Mm. <clears throat> um, 
but you know that's a good question and it's 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 one that I kind of ask myself every day at the end of every day because there are new discoveries every day but I think you know one of the things that uh, as I've thought about it now I'm four years into this walk uh, is um, discoveries about myself as much as the world and I think that's kind of cool and when you guys take your walks through your neighborhoods that's probably a pretty cool thing to do too is you learn things not just about the world but about yourself so let me just start there I'll say it's I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at how easy it's been and how natural it seems to be walking through the world like this I thought it would be much much more difficult um, and then the second thing is uh, how much goodness there is in the world um, because I spent in my past a lot of time covering very difficult subjects um, you know often people who are having trouble with each other um, and now on this project I've seen the flip side of the human heart more often which is how people help each other out and I think uh, that's been probably the single greatest discovery Thank you, Paul. Um, and that, that question and your response actually relates to another question that was sent in by some kindergartners in, um, in Athens, Greece. Um, the question is, if you were to write a story about the people and places you have visited so far, would it be a sad or a happy story and why? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question too. As a writer, that's an important one. Um, as, as those of you who have been following the storytelling um, know, um, the journey, the Out of Eden Walk journey has taken me through some pretty um, troubled parts of the world, parts of the world that um, have a bit of turmoil in them, that have uh, maybe conflict, um, have mass, mass refugee movements that have been very painful. I mean, there's a lot of pain in those places Do you know, that is, it's been one of the more heart-wrenching parts of the journey. But by and large, by and large, um, it's been happy stories. It's been stories of quiet happiness. You know, people, on a few occasions, I've joined them dancing and hopping up and down with joy, but basically most people are, the default mode is to, for all of us, I think, is to find what good we can in our daily life, even if our life is hard. And this circles back to the original question that triggered this question, is that even in difficult scenarios like refugee camps, people find joy. And I think it's our task to help each other to get to better places but to not dismiss people who are in difficult circumstances as as kind of only one dimension of tragedy mm -hmm. because they find joy in their lives and they can help us who are more fortunate through lessons of, of how to find goodness even in terrible circumstances I think that's what's so, so it's been a it's been a good a good story so far great thank you Paul Kristen, I'm excited to hear a question from you or that was shared with you earlier today from one of your students. Can you unmute your microphone? I, I just missed because uh, because I think because we were going for winter holidays, the kids all had food on their minds. So every single question I got was food related. <laughs> but I know, you, I know you've talked about that before, so you're welcome to talk to us about food. But the other thing that as a class we've wondered about before, um, which you just did a milestone that had beekeepers in it and some bees in it. Mm -hmm. And behind me, you can see this is an observation hive we have in our classroom. Oh, cool. And we study pollinators. So mm -hmm. another question we've pondered at other less foodie times is um, just what are you seeing about cultures and pollinators as you travel? So mm -hmm. you're welcome to address either one at any point. Hmm, interesting. You know, maybe, you know, I'll take, the, since you guys are focused on, on the importance of pollinators, I'll try my best. It's not, it's not a topic that I've focused on, but off the top of my head, honey, honey uh, binds us together in a certain way, because every culture I've gone through, whether, you know, in, in Arabic it's asil, you know, in, in, in the Spanish-speaking world it's, it's miel, um, honey has a special significance. It's not just a jar at a supermarket. And one of the great, I was just telling somebody the other day, one of the, or my friends here, that if I were kind of reincarnated in Uzbekistan, I'd want to be a honey seller because they sell their honey on bicycles and they go through villages and they make a, a certain call saying, you know, we've got honey. And everybody likes honey. And it's kind of, you're bringing happiness to villages in these little golden jars. 
So um, I think the, the beekeepers I've spoken to, and I've spoken to them in about three countries, I'm thinking now uh, in Jordan and in Turkey and in Uzbekistan, all the beekeepers I've met are a little concerned about the health of their bees because there have been these global problems with you know the, the mysteries of dying bees. Um, so um, everybody's a bit um, anxious about the future of, of our, pollin our pollinators who don't just supply honey, but of course give us the vegetables and fruits that we eat. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, so uh, you often get this question, but I think it's worth asking again. And we had a couple of students from from Greece, from two different kindergarten classrooms in Greece, asking, uh, number one, how often are your shoes worn out? And number two, do your feet hurt? Okay. Um, number one, um, you know, I've been, I'm four years in, and I, I often wear a certain kind of, of hiking shoe. And I think the calculation now is about uh, 1,500 or 600 kilometers or 1,000 miles per pair, right? And it, and it depends on the surface. If I'm doing a lot of road walking, they wear out more quickly. If I'm walking through soft deserts, they, they last longer. Mm. When they break, I go to a local pasar and just buy whatever's available. I've bought sandals. I've bought, you know, local sneakers. Um, one of my walking partners in Turkey walked for a while in shower flip-flops um, and... Uh, just you do what you what you can to walk across the world finding footwear. Do my feet hurt? Yeah, sometimes. I think more often my head hurts because I'm a journalist and I have lots mm. of deadlines and so I think the problem was, is with the other end of my body. My feet are okay. <laughs> Terrific. Well, let's hope the head holds up too. Uh, yes, let's do that. Let's think, send good thoughts to this. Um, so Mark, uh, a question from you or from your students. I have a question from a sixth grader. I'm supporting about 10 classes at a, a school that has lots of immigrant students in, in Oxnard, and uh, we're really enjoying the journey. Um, but what's the longest that you've walked in one day so far? Mm, yeah, that was a day, um, a very memorable day in, in the, the Hejaz Desert of uh, Western Saudi Arabia when we were obliged to uh, reach a water source and we didn't realize it was so far away. You know, when you're in deserts, you walk from water to water. And we did a, a miscalculation. So we ended up walking, I think it was about 55 kilometers or so, 53, 54. What is that? That's like 32 miles, um, which is a long way, not just for us, but we had two camels with us and the camels were really tired at the end of that day. We, we finally reached the water source, the well, after midnight, like one in the morning. And I thought our hike yesterday was long. <laughs> <laughs> well, everything's relative. It was certainly more steep. Yes, yes, that's true. Um, thank you, Paul. Rob, a question from you or, or from a student. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? She yes, can. we can. Yes, okay, our class has been studying the uh, ancient Silk Roads, and we understand that the Chinese are investing a lot of money to promote a new Silk Road. I have a student who would like to ask a question. What is trade like on the New Silk Road? Cool, that's a really good question. Yeah, that's a great question because when you mention the two words, Silk Road, together you have images of camels and, and yet the Silk Road continues today, right? And that's something I'm writing about actually right now. Um, China has invested trillions of dollars, I think, in something called uh, One Road, One Belt, it's the most expensive infrastructure project in the history of the world, and it's designed to tie together Europe and Asia with you know, shipping routes and highways and railroads and infrastructure throughout the uh, Eurasian continent. Um, it looks like from foot level today, it looks like uh, Turkish trucks roaring past on a highway built by South Koreans. Um, it looks like um, Railroads are built partly with Australian technology um, that are being plied by trains uh, from Belarusia. Um, so what it is is basically a miniature snapshot of globalization. Mm. And these, the, the things, the products that they're carrying are every single product under the sun. I mean, from gigantic oil pipe pipes that carry oil to uh, iPhones. That's what, that's what the Silk Road looks like today, and it's busy. 
Great question, thank you. Um, there's a question I wanna share from some uh, fifth graders in Danville, California that was sent by email a while ago. Um, Paul, what is a challenge or fear that you think you might have to face as you walk through Central Asia specifically? Mm, okay. Um, you know, I think I think. Uh, let me just be very specific um, on this this answer, this question. You know, that like the next challenge in Central Asia is uh, landscape based, mm -hmm. and that's a big, big desert that lies ahead. It's called the Taklamakan. What a beautiful name, huh? Taklamakan. It has a. It, it's a, it's. I think the. Nobody knows the origin of the name. They, it might be Persian based. It's certainly not Chinese, and it's something like um, the place of of nowhere. Um, but that's a big desert. Um, it's about four to five hundred kilometers across, two hundred fifty to three hundred miles. There's very little water, and so that'll be a challenge to get through. And, and I'm kind of on a deadline with that desert to get across before it gets really hot. You know, fifty degrees or one hundred twenty degrees Fahrenheit. Great, thank you, Steve. We wanna um, we wanna see if your your audio is working. We hope to hear a question from you or from a student. Let's give it a shot. Okay, we still can't hear you, unfortunately, but if you send a question by email, um, Shay is going to hand it to me, and we will loop back to you um, as soon as we can, as soon as I get that question and, um, and ask it. Um, Brenda, I'm going to loop back to you. Do you have another question uh, from yourself or from your students for Paul? I do. All of the questions I have are for my students, just saying so you know. So oh. this one I thought was a, an interesting one. Um, student asked, do the hours affect you, like walking so much? And she, she called it, do you have walking lag? And she was saying like jet lag, but instead from walking. So I don't know how you want to answer that, but she's wondering, do you get that fatigue from the constant walking? Mm. That's interesting. A uh, question about time as much as about, you know, muscles. You know, when we when we jet around the world, we get jet lag because we're traveling so quickly. You know, I think the what I can say to her is that the opposite happens walking, because walking is so natural and organic, and it's what we've evolved to do for two hundred thousand years. You are always in the moment. You're never walk lagged. Um, you know, you might get tired physically, and at the end of the day, certainly I'm tired, and I have to try to stay awake to write my notes and to send a story, and I'm nodding off. But that's physical. It's not temporal. It's not time based. So I have one advantage is that I don't have to suffer from jet lag on this journey. And I've crossed, um, since starting out, I think about five time zones. Um, I've walked through five time zones and that's pretty far. And um, I have no problem making adjustments so far. Great. So uh, Steve, thank you. You sent uh, questions from your students in by email. So I'm excited to have your students' voice in the mix now. Um, so two questions for you, Paul, from mm -hmm. Steve's students. What is the most dangerous situation you experienced during your journey mm -hmm. uh, so far? And what drives you forward in your journey? Okay. Um, um, there have been some, some uh, tough times, some difficult challenges on the, on the walk. Um, the first category uh, are physical geography obstacles, like the desert crossing I was telling you earlier, right? Having to walk, you know, more than 50 kilometers to find water. You know, that makes you feel pretty vulnerable when you're thirsty. So um, that's one example. Or crossing snowy mountains and, and falling in a hole and, you know, twisting my leg. That happened in uh, the Caucasus Mountains in a country called Georgia. And I had to be helped down the mountain through like waist deep snow by my walking partners and it was very cold and so that was uh, felt a bit a bit scary um the other the other uh, source is human um i've been had great luck i've not you know been you know severely threatened but there have been a co couple misunderstandings when i've walked through conflict zones and uh, people mistake me people who you know wear uniforms armed men um and we've had some some tough encounters, but fortunately we've been able to, to talk our way through those. So those would be a couple examples. That was maybe, for example, in Turkey, one place. Great. Great questions. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, terrific. Um, I want to ask a somewhat related question from a fifth grade class in Maine. Have you ever seen an act of stereotype? Mm -hmm. And have you ever assumed anything? Yes, um, and that, that does tie into this previous question. And, and, and the best example of kind of 
mutual stereotyping, which happens a lot, right? It's not just one way, is walking through Turkey and, and, and running into a group of, of soldiers. And I was surprised at first to run into them because I was in, a, in an area of Turkey that's mainly ethnically Kurd. It's a minority. And I was getting along great with Kurds. Um, and I thought, well, why are these guys giving us trouble? They stopped us. They detained us. Um, and so I made the assumption, the stereotype, that these would be kind of good guys. And instead, they were treating us, you know, with, with pretty firmly, pretty aggressively. And so I had made an assumption that they were kind of on my side when they weren't. And they made an assumption that I was an enemy when I wasn't. So there's mutual stereotyping there. And the story takes another twist, is that after we spoke, after a moment when we were, things were tense, and we actually explained what each other's purpose and mission was, then we, were, we, swip, we swapped our perceptions of each other. Then I became their buddy, and then I saw them as not necessarily bad guys, right? They were kind of doing their job, and they were living in a very difficult um, environment. So these kind of stereotyping happens all the time. Um, it's almost inescapable when it's our, it's our task to try to penetrate, to get through these surface impressions to the real person underneath. Great. And that makes me think of something that you've often said in the past, Paul, about moving slowly through the world, mm -hmm. that um, you, f in a way, feel safer when you're right. moving slowly. That's right. That's exactly true. And even this in incident is a good example. I think if I had been traveling in a car, these, these guys, these soldiers would have been even more anxious or frightened. You know, what we discovered when we were frightened of each other, and that when you're driving through quickly and they couldn't stop us, they might have, you know, done something dramatic. Instead, by slowing down and they see me approaching slowly from a distance, they're able to prepare, prepare themselves for an encounter. And I'm able to prepare myself on the trail because I can talk to villagers and other people on the way who then steer me away from danger. So walking is, is, a, is in itself kind of a, a safety valve. Mm. Um, so I want to loop back to the second question that uh, Steve's students asked, which was, "What um, what drives you forward in your journey?" Make sure we. Yeah, you that. know that's that's a great question too, because what I'm doing sounds pretty radical to many people, and I think it's you know what I have to remind people is I'm doing this because it's my work. You know, I'm a writer, I'm a journalist, uh, I cover international issues. And so walking across the world on the, on the footsteps of the ancestors is my job now. And so I'm driven by trying to become a better writer and by extension to try to help with, through my writing to build bridges of understanding between people. And so there's a personal reason and, and, a, and a wider reason of sharing and that keeps me going. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing privilege to be doing what I'm doing. I'm very lucky. I'm a lucky man. And I'll just add that those bridges of understanding feel more important than ever right. every single day. Absolutely. Today. Yeah. Um, so, John, I want to loop back to you and your students and see if you have further questions. Yeah. Our, our students were very interested in the logistics of your work. Mm -hmm. um, and what question? Who supports you in your journey? Okay. Who supports me? All right. Good question. That's a, and it's and it's important to acknowledge this enormous group, this a community that supports me, right? Because I'm not walking this alone. Um, I hope that's I hope that's obvious. I've written about it many times. I'm supported by local people who help me with logistics, like um, um, providing directions, uh, providing supplies. Um, warning me about dangers. I'm supported by um, my my media partner, National Geographic, who do tremendous work, you know, preparing the ground ahead. Um, uh, who help fund the project. I'm supported by my education partners at Project Zero, who help me communicate with you guys, which is becoming a, an increasingly important part of my mission. So I can safely say that probably. Uh, thousands and thousands of people support the walk, including every single student sitting in your room, because just talking to you boosts my morale. So you guys are part of the walking posse. I can I've just kind of included you in the family. Um, so I'm supported by you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. 
we're back to you. Did, do you have another student with a question for Paul? Uh, yeah, I've got another one as well. Oh. Again, sort of connected to your logistics and... Okay. Do you ever get sick? Oh. And perhaps what happens, you know, if you do, what, what, do you have any plans in place or...? Yeah, that's a good question too, because when we all travel, right, we, we get exposed to new bugs. Their bugs are all over the world and you get sick. Yeah, I do get sick. Um, I got sick in, in Palestine. <clears throat> I picked up a case of pneumonia. Um, you know, it's interesting. I've been thinking about this. Uh, uh, I spend so much time in rural areas, countryside, that whenever I come in, when I walk into a big city, I often get sick. I get a flu. I get a cold because my immune system is not prepared for the new bugs that are in, you know, densely populated urban areas. So I kind of get I get sick on a cycle whenever I hit a big city. And what do I do? I do the same thing you guys do. You know, I take medicines on, on a few occasions. I might visit a doctor. Um, when I'm in the countryside and I get sick, I use local remedies with whatever the farmers or, or, or herders use, you know, a lot of, of home remedies, herbs, um, um, even uh, folk healing where, you know, folk healers have laid their hands on me and prayed over me and, and tried to make me better. So many doctors, many methods of curing. Great question. It is, yeah. Kelly, back to you. We have one of our year six students that will be asking a question. Hi, I'm a student from 6B from Chinese International School in Hong Kong. So my question is, where do you get your food supplies from? And that question was, where do you get your food supplies from? Okay, good question. Yeah. You know, when you're walking all day, you need to eat a lot because you're burning a lot of energy. So you, you have to have food every day. Um, I to get it where, where local people get it. So let's say I'm walking through um, a countryside region where there are farms and there are no shops around. I go, to, I go to farms and I knock on the door and I say, hey, is there any, any food I can buy from you? Or can I, can, I, can I harvest some of the fruit that's in your orchard and I'll pay you for it? Um, or if you, have, if you have some cows, can I buy some cheese uh, or, or whatnot? And that, so it's living off the land a little bit. Um, and then the other way is, um, when I come to towns or villages, I go to shops, just the way you guys do, and uh, buy canned food or the kind of food that you guys take when you go camping, maybe, or when you go hiking. Food that keeps, that doesn't spoil, that doesn't need refrigeration. So uh, it's a mix of things. It depends on what food's available. Okay. All right. Thank you. Kristen. Kind of back to you when uh, your your students had all those questions about food, <laughs> and we well, just had it. I covered it. I was like all prepared for that one. Um, but I I I was curious just to myself. There's been a lot of um, forever talk about climate change, but particularly in the U.S. right now, there are a lot of issues around that. And you've talked about it as one of your things you're looking at as you travel. Is climate change something that you find that people are thinking about or talking about or seeing as an issue as you travel? Yeah. Or is that just no, that's a certain great, place? That's a great, great question and an important one. I just posted or published a story for WEZ in Chicago uh, about climate change, walking through climate change. Um, so take a look at that. That will help your students kind of uh, delve a little more deeply. And the, the, the kind of the uh, conclusion of, my, of that article was that I, I'm finding it everywhere. Everybody's talking about climate change. And since I've been walking through a lot of rural areas where people live directly off the land, these are, you know, whose, whose livelihoods depend on, on climate, like farmers. You, you, you know, if you're dependent on rain, your existence is threatened if climate change. If you depend on a river for irrigation, your existence is threatened by climate change. Um, and I think it's probably, it's universal. If I spend, you know, an hour with someone, it will come up, uh, the climate change issue, among other things, right? Um, so it truly is a sobering time to be uh, moving through the world at a time when there's this unknowable fundamental change in, in, in our planet. And I hope to be writing much more about it. Great question. Mark. So 
So um, our students have really enjoyed uh, the journey and watching you walk, and a lot of it's been semi-arid like California. It doesn't seem like you get a lot of rain, um, but just beautiful places. And one student in Miss Story's class asked, what's the prettiest place that you've been? If you could take us all to one place, what would that place be? And what was your favorite part about that place? Wow. God, it's, it's so hard. I mean, I, I don't mean to cop out on, on giving you the one place. Um, I was I was born in the Mojave Desert of California, um, and so I'm partial to deserts. Um, I like deserts, uh, and there, I've walked through some extraordinarily beautiful deserts. I think the desert of the Hejaz in Saudi Arabia, its minimal beauty, its its beauty of of absence. Deserts are des deserts ring with absences. Um, was augmented by minimal human modifications through time and, and one of the I guess let me just stick with one country to be fair to all the countries so Saudi Arabia the most beautiful parts of the desert were following the Tariq al Hajj which are the old Hajj pilgrimage routes that are that stopped being used a hundred years ago but had been used for a thousand years before and they were indentations in the stones through mountains grooves worn into the land like lines of music by probably hundreds of thousands of pilgrims and their camel trains and just walking along these polished grooves of movement towards Mecca was uh, an extraordinarily beautiful uh, part of the world to be walking with partly because they were forgotten and of course modern Saudis don't walk them right everybody's motorized now I've come to really appreciate the beauty in Kyrgyzstan actually being here. Mm -hmm. And I can see where Paul is, you know, it's the, this question is really challenging because mm -hmm. there are so many beautiful places in the world, but we had the good fortune of walking in the mountains outside Bishkek yesterday with yeah, Paul. Gorgeous. It was tremendous. Rob, a question from one of your students? Yes. Okay, we have two questions. Uh, one question is, um, since we've been studying the ancient Silk Roads, how are these cultures trying to retain their culture despite with, with all of these changes happening? And the second question, um, can you ask this? Yeah. In Milestone 44, you talked with the first women in Uzbekistan. Do you find women are hesitant to talk to you? If so, why? Yeah. Two, two really good questions and, and, and complicated an complicated answers to both. I'll try to keep it short. I think every, I've, I've walked through Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan so far, and I'll soon, I hope we'll be walking through Western China in terms of the Silk Road route. And I find that, you know, different people in different countries have different approaches to preserving their culture. Um, um, most countries have a, like a ministry of culture and they try to promote, you know, um, art festivals, conferences, public exhibitions of traditional art, whether it's music, dance, um, or the plastic arts, sculpture. So there's kind of an institutional, um, like a government level uh, program to try to preserve memory. But there's also kind of individual efforts, right? Where like, you know, old people, older people in a, in a small community or village will get together and sing. Uh, as you guys may be learning in your research, there are these epic, epic, songs in Central Asia that go on for hours and hours and hours and they're traditional musicians who have memorized, you know, thousands of lines of epic poetry and it's remarkable to see them share those, uh, those stories. Um, so two levels, uh, individual and, and kind of governmental. They also teach it in schools as I'm sure there in India. They also, you know, you guys are learning about Indian culture. Um, so many different layers and I think people want to hold on to that as much as the world is changing and it's like a you know a tidal wave of change these days we, we realize we have to there's something beautiful but holding on to some anchors um, from the ancestors some some or maybe better way some talismans that we can put in our pocket from our ancestors and as we continue walking through a very changeable world that we can look out and say yeah that that's part of me is this talisman right this 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 sense of identity um, the second question about women is, it's been a challenge and um, it's, it's kind of, you know, as a reporter for many, many years, I, 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 I've written about women, of course, um, and, and I actually try to gravitate often towards uh, women in a story because their voices often are not represented. Um, I, have a, a, I have a structural 
problem with the walk and that I'm a man and I'm a stranger and I'm often kind of dirty and stinky uh, when I'm coming into somebody's village or somebody's town. So maybe even I would not approach me if I were walking <laughs> in, right? But I also think it's more than that, truly, because I'm walking with some pretty clever people who know local culture and know kind of how to bridge uh, gender divides. They're smart uh, people. And even they are surprised in their own culture saying, wow, you know, I didn't realize how difficult this was. Now that you're walking through with me, Paul, I'm kind of seeing it from an outsider's eyes, how these gender barriers are and how strong they can be. So we've been, we've been butting our heads up against those barriers and um, we finally, you know, were able to include some women's voices. I think there were two uh, Uzbek milestones so far that had women in them and they were, they were wonderful. But we're gonna try to do more, of course. Steve, I haven't received another question uh, via email, but if you do have one, maybe uh, send it on and we can sneak it in before the end of our hour. Um, and I want to loop back uh, to, to someone else who might have a question from one of their students. Um, how, about, how about John? Um, is there another, another question bubbling up? Yeah, we've got, we've got another question. We've got a student coming here. Good question, yeah. Um, a couple of places. Um, I'd like to name every country along the way, that's the honest answer. But if I were forced to choose, I would choose places that I don't know, right? Because that's the excitement of discovery. So I've never been to China. That's exciting to me. I'm looking forward to, to walking through parts of China. I've never been to India. You know, I've been to Bangladesh, I've been to Nepal, and like both of those places, but I've never set foot in India. So I'm looking forward to, to discovering India on foot. And then the last place in route, which is quite a ways off, maybe two years or so, is, is Siberia in Russia. I've read a lot about Siberia and uh, look forward to walking through that landscape. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, Kelly, do we have another question from a student in, in the room with you there? We definitely do. Let's give us a moment. Can you stand up? Can you just speak up? Just one moment. Sure. <laughs> Don't say your name. Okay, just one moment. Let's have. Speak. Hello. Hello. Speak to the computer. Very quick voice. Hello. Hi. Hi. CIS 6B from Hong Kong. Um, what precautions do you have to take when you, when other people treat you aggressively? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's an interesting question. What 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 uh, precautions do I take um, when people are a bit aggressive? Um, you know, the I, I I go by default to uh, what this project's about. I I, de I go to my legs. So I, I back up, uh, you know, after a period of trying to negotiate with them, if it's not working, I'm a walking guy, I, I walk away, right? I, I let them, you know, I don't want to encourage them uh, in their aggressiveness. And if it's not working, we, I just move on. And so um, what I've discovered though, is that if, you, if, if they will listen to you, and if I listen to them, if we listen to each other for a while, that initial hostile encounter uh, can be really, and I'm not joking, I'm not just pretending that it's a happy world, you can turn it completely around so that the initial negative interaction becomes a really positive one and, and that person ends up helping you a lot. And that's, that's worked a lot. Think about this, like at border crossings, right? Where, which can, can be chaotic and kind of tense and they're, they're guys whose jobs are to kind of, you know, make sure to control the crossing. If, if, if you find a way, uh, a human connection with them, they can end up changing from being kind of like a, a hostile obstacle to your journey to actually saying, wow, Paul, I'm gonna really help you 
get through this bureaucracy and paperwork quickly. That's just one example. That's really helpful. Thank you, especially for students that might deal with conflicts and challenges at school um, and across cultures. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was quite helpful. Thank you. No, oh, it's great. It's we, we all deal with this, whether it's it's, you know, in the hallway or it's on um, a desert highway in Uzbekistan. Great, thank you. Um, so we do have another question from one of Steve's students, um, which is, why do you think people differ from place to place? Small question. Mm, okay. <laughs> you know, honest answer is, I'm still trying to figure that out myself. Um, and uh, I welcome your thoughts, maybe on a future interaction, what you guys think, what, you know, in your experience in your life, when you meet different people, you know, what are the reasons why we're different? And I think it's it's a fast it's you know you you're putting your finger on why I'm a writer, um, because I find the differences between people to be really just endless material. And, and what I've said before is, as I as I as a journalist even before this project, the commonality how how much we have in common is always striking. And it's like ninety nine percent of the time we 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 all have the same concerns and we like the same things. Uh, which is no surprise, we're family, right? Um, but then the, the quirky things that make us individuals are also fascinating to me because even as much as we're all alike, every single human being that I've met in my life, not just on this journey, is a unique um, creation and a, and a cosmos in herself or himself. And how crazy is that? It's just, it's just it's mind boggling that we're so different on small ways and it's it's what allows to set off little sparks between us that that I think conjure wonder and often absurdity and awe I think that's great thanks Paul and I, I'm glad you mentioned wonder and awe and sort of curiosity which mm. is really important and links back to what you said earlier about the importance of bridging um, you know, creating better understandings of one another right. and that sort of curiosity is a starting point. Um, so as our time is coming to a close, I want to ask two uh, somewhat seasonal questions that uh, were sent in from uh, some kindergartners in Greece. Um, so the first one is, if you continue walking at Christmas, are you worried that Santa won't find you? If yes, what kind of map would you make to help him find you? You know, this is a great question because I've been a little worried about it. So <laughs> my, my request to all of you guys is that in your communication with Santa, could you just mention me? Could you just say with this guy, he's in, he's in Central Asia. If you need GPS coordinates, I'm happy to provide them. Um, put a good word in for me and let him know where I am. Great, I'll tell my kids too. Thank you. Um, and then there was another question, um, which is, where will you be on New Year's Eve? I think um, I'll be here in, in Bishkek. Um, in, At a nightclub. I'll be, I'll be discoing it out. <laughs> what can I say? I can't help myself. <laughs> I, I sing in the shower too. Fortunately, I don't take too many showers these days, so I don't have to punish people. But um, I'll be here. What's fun is that it's celebrated like, like it's one of the great big celebrations of the year here in, in, in Kyrgyzstan, and I've got some friends who are going to take me out and show me a good time. Terrific. Thank you so much for your time this morning, Paul, with us, and thanks to everyone Thank who you, joined, um, to all of the students who sent in questions in advance and who uh, shared their questions over audio. And before I officially close, Shea is writing me a note. <laughs> Students, um, let's, um, let's, we want to hear you with a big, loud uh, farewell, and thank you um, for all your questions. So if everyone who has students with them um, can unmute their mics, and actually everyone unmute your mics, oh because you can speak for your students even if they're not in the same room right, as you. Right. You ready? Okay, one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys. <laughs> it's kind of, it sounds like a standing ovation. We should stand up. <laughs> yes. Thank you everybody. Thanks all. Talk to you again Bye. soon, I hope. Talk soon. Be well. <laughs> bye bye.